I'm Matt Landis with NGDU. Uh, Mark Delora from De Developer Relations is away at E3, so he's only here in spirit. We're pleased to kick off our Tech Talk series about serious games and games in education with this talk by Ben Sawyer. Uh, Ben's name is synonymous with serious games. He's been well, a well-known advocate, champion, and developer in this space for over 10 years. He's co-founder of the Serious Games Initiative, Games for Health Project, and Digital Mill, a game design and development firm. In addition, he served as the Serious Games Summit Chair at GDC. We're pleased to have him here, and we're looking forward to getting his perspective on the state of serious games and the needs of large and small game developers alike. Thanks. Um, thanks, Matt. And uh, I'll see Mark soon at E3. Uh, so I'm glad he's here in spirit. But um, knowing E3, I, I, that spirit's probably a fairly low level right now um, in terms of what he's about to go through. So he's familiar with it. So the title of this presentation is Games Everywhere. Uh, and within it uh, is this sort of evolutionary thought pattern that I've had as I've watched web services and other types of cool web applications come about and really spent some time in the trenches trying to build some of this stuff uh, and what the larger role for those could be. So I'm going to go pretty quick because there's a lot of information to cover and I know that you're all um, eager to get back to um, other endeavors. But uh, one of my first slides is always this one. Uh, I promise all my game development friends that I don't throw commercial entertainment games under the rug when I talk about serious games. I think it's an important part of being human is to be entertained and to entertain other people. Uh, but from a serious side, I think games have this pretty well solved entertainment uh, for that matter. But uh, it's important to remind ourselves that just sitting by on a, on a Sunday afternoon and engrossing yourself in a game like Spore uh, or um, Call of Duty or any of the other great games is, is an important part. So just a little bit more about me. Uh, I did find this book one day. Um, and I read it. It didn't help me too much, but it was kind of neat to think that somebody actually had this put into a book. Uh, that's the first computer I ever spent a significant amount of time programming. Uh, I worked on some earlier computers before then. Uh, every six-year-old should be given a lightsaber on their sixth birthday. Uh, I dug that out. Um, those are my two kids. Um, we also, we're, we're a family of Lego fanatics. We actually have a Lego basement uh, where we keep them all and, and build um, furiously into the evening. Those are some of the projects that I've done. Here's a, a sort of a number of games that I've worked on either as a producer or a designer. Uh, what's important about this is just um, simply to establish that not only do I talk about this stuff, but I actually get in here and work on the design and development of it, and I use both to inform the other. The other thing is that there's um, a decent diversity of work here, um, stuff for the military, stuff for STEM education, uh, corporate training for Cisco, uh, a walking game for Humana that is about ostensibly exercise, uh, a game to help uh, university presidents better manage their universities, uh, and a number of conference activities that we do to try and build this sort of rising tide and best practices uh, in the serious game space. I also require this slide of all my speakers whenever I can at my conferences. Uh, it's basically what I'm playing lately. Uh, again, uh, I, I play a lot of different kinds of games. I'm a lifelong gamer. Uh, and, you know, it's important um, as a designer to play these types of games, to really get in there. And by requiring this slide of my speakers, many of whom will sometimes be academics or, or analysts, it's a way of keeping everybody honest. I sometimes find that people who like to talk about games spend more time talking about them than playing. Uh, and this is a way to um, sort of say that's kind of a, a bad way to be a games analyst or a researcher. So these are the goals that I have today. Uh, it's to shine this spotlight um, beyond the sort of conventional forms of games, uh, to deepen your understanding of serious games and the serious game space, to link to this uh, future of games and serious games to the pervasive web services that we're really sort of seeing built by companies like Google, and to elevate games, in my opinion, to a larger strategic opportunity, especially for um, large organizations. And some of the key points that I'll make is that the games are really heading everywhere. If you spend a lot of time looking at games, both on the commercial entertainment side as well as the serious game side, you really start to see um, just an incredible explosion of different types of games for different types of markets or different types of purposes. And games, as a result of that, should be this sort of strategic opportunity. And the evolution and the larger utility of game design and engineering patterns, the things that we actually 
the pr design processes and ideas that we take from games are starting to seep into other walks of life, even things that we wouldn't ostensibly call games. But overall, we need some better infrastructure if we're going to see this idea that games could be everywhere uh, in everyday parts of our lives um, than where we are right now. Now, why would, I, why would I spend 10 years of my life sort of pursuing this idea of serious games? Uh, well, these are some of the reasons. I, I think, and, and others like me think, that games have a role in solving our problems. Uh, does it mean that a game is going to be the ultimate solver of, of all of life's problems? Probably not. Uh, but it, there's, no, there's no reason to leave it on the wayside. The problems and the challenges that we face today really require that sort of, you know, to, to beat a, a, an often used phrase to death, uh, you know, all hands on deck. Uh, and video games are probably the most powerful media form that we have going right now. Uh, and to think that we're just going to leave them alone just for, just for play seems, seems sort of wrong. And it's proven through some of the existing work uh, in the serious game space that games can play substantive roles. Um, we've seen games that have proven in research studies to help people with their health, to help people with their learning, uh, to change their opinions, to collect data from people in new ways that we couldn't do before, to sell products, uh, and to do many other types of things that we do in everyday life. And we need more accelerants. That's the other reason I'm here. We need more people sort of thinking about how this idea of games and games being everywhere can lead to solving some of their problems and thinking about the types of investments that you need to make in the infrastructure for really all of our sakes. So there's my explanation. So what do we mean by games being everywhere? So right now, games are a huge category of entertainment. Uh, I often say to people, if you want to understand what games are doing within media, go talk to a television executive and ask them where some of their audience is. Uh, they're not watching television. They're playing Farmville. They're playing World of Warcraft. They're playing Call of Duty. They're playing video games. Then there's this whole non-entertainment sector, the place where I spend most of my time. Uh, and I will show you some of the areas that games are creeping into. There's also this whole idea of technology transfer. Uh, the technologies from games that are spawned out of this industry are ending up in all kinds of different places, or are technologies that have, in general, would have come about, but come about in a faster pace because me and my friends who play games spend tons of money on things like 3D GPU chips. And then we have the spread of this design philosophy and then the rise in culture. So let's look a little bit at that. From a games everywhere standpoint, we're, we're most used to the first column, you know, games at home. This is where we play and we, right now we're seeing games are not just being played on our PC, but we have game consoles and now we have tablets. And now we have phones. A lot of my, uh, my two kids play games on the phone when the console is not being used. And then, of course, we have the whole mobile explosion going on. And then work, where people are playing games mostly on PCs, um, but it, it, it's increasingly on phones and, and then potentially on tablets to the extent that tablets make it into uh, the workforce. And that person is playing actually a forklift safety game in that picture. So in the Serious Games uh, initiative, we took uh, some effort to kind of build out this taxonomy of Serious Games, because one of the things that was happening was that the Serious Games space was sort of being defined as a couple of specific areas. You're like, oh, yeah, that's that games for training stuff, or that, that's that stuff for the military using video game engines. Uh, and so what we did was we went out and canvassed and then reorganized um, the entire Serious Games space across the top by the types of um, areas that an organization might use, like health and advertising and training and education and production uh, and even work. And then down the left-hand side, uh, looking at the various industrial sectors, government, defense, healthcare, uh, and then creating this sort of matrix. And you know, without going into detail of it, the idea is to show you that there's a lot of potential, and this potential goes beyond commonly um, used area, commonly cited areas like learning and training. Uh, just to make sure that we weren't just kind of putting up conjecture, we went out, and this was, this was uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, we went out and I said, let's find at least one example for each of those squares of a project that was either in development or was part of a research grant or was actually a shipping product. So you can see, like, well over two thirds. And that was, that was over a couple of years ago. Uh, and many of these areas already had multiple um, entries, uh, multiple uh, examples of the work. So this is, this is not something that's confined to a couple of squares. But let's look at the technology transfer. 
So the video game industry globally, hardware and software, depending on what you look at, 70 to $80 billion um, in the next couple of years. So if you were to kind of backtrack through their, their revenues and sort of figure out what their R&D level is, it's anywhere from 10 to $20 billion being spent. And these key outputs coming from it, graphics, visualization, AI, synchronous networking, a lot of anti-fraud stuff now in World of Warcraft and other types of games. Not just looking for credit card fraud, but people doing things like gold farming, um, sort of asymmetric behaviors that they want to stop, uh, things that they feel will corrupt the gameplay, let alone are stealing potential money um, or accounts. Uh, so how do you find those types of behaviors in their data set is of great interest to people who are looking for similar types of um, activities in their own data sets. And you can imagine who they are. Uh, so the psychology of games, interface, virtual humans, uh, and this rapid innovation, that's what's going on. I mean, the, the, the Darwinian environment of the games business, if you're, if you're, you can have a string of hit games, have one bad hit, and your studio closes, or your team is dissolved. It's brutal. Um, so the stress is, you know, both good and bad in terms of what we get out of it. And I've often sort of uh, compared the video game industry as like a private version of NASA, except we're getting a little bit more cast off to the rest of us be, um, than I would have thought. And, and it, unfortunately, though, it just doesn't include Tang, right? So one of the other areas, the way to look at technology transfer when I evangelize this in places like DC and stuff is I go, okay, well, maybe you're not that interested in games. You just don't understand as deeply and passionately as I do. I go, but you probably have like a lot of deep passion in this town for robotics, especially if I'm over in Virginia. Uh, and they go, yeah, yeah, well, absolutely robotics. We're, we, we're investing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in robotics. I go, well, then what is this Gray Warden inside BioWare's uh, Dragon Age game? He's a non-player character. He's, just, he's in a 3D world. He has to move around objects. He has to talk to people. He has to have some sort of visioning as to what's going on in a dynamic environment. I mean, he's essentially a robot. He's just a virtual robot. Uh, and the types of things that they have to work on and game developers spend their days working on, like pathfinding, um, are the same things that a lot of people who work in robotics work on. Uh, so the idea that you could actually get game developers who've never worked in robotics together and, and roboticists who've never worked in games and probably find that there's a lot of common challenges and common approaches or different approaches that could help each other um, is something that really hits home to people who haven't quite thought about it that way. So we look at games as um, a computational form of media uh, and it must communicate effectively to the player or it fails. And when you fail in the game space, it's pretty brutal. Uh, just go read reviews of bad games on hardcore gaming websites. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's choice language. Uh, and then games, in my opinion, democratize the power of simulation. They take something that we um, call simulation and they sort of pare it down and make it more accessible. Uh, and so this is sort of like Will Wright's career in a nutshell, right? This is what he's done. Uh, and he's done it quite effectively. And we've seen the kinds of opportunities um, that come out of that, um, you know, whoops, we a little, sorry, with a little, little pop-up problem, okay. So he's, he's done that and shown what happens when you can get millions of people to sort of think about zoning in cities or the way, um, the power of the scale of the universe. Um, what's that worth, even though it's not as much depth as say what might go on in a university simulation lab, what's the, what's the, um, upside and byproduct of, say, 10 million people having some level of experience with that. And there are these crucibles and petri dishes of human behavior inside games. Of course, what's also great about them is they're measurable. We can measure everything inside the game. Um, the World of Warcraft economy is a, is a perfectly measurable economy, um, which makes it somewhat better than the one that we have in real life. Uh, and the foundational outputs in the R&D in games, as I said, have utility beyond, beyond that. So one of these like, sort of more amorphous ways that we see this happening is in this area that we now call funware. So this is um, things like ACOA, which give out these like, sort of mission packs. Go take a picture of yourself doing something silly and upload it and get your friends to give you points for it. Uh, go buy somebody lunch today. Go give someone a book you've never done before. And they sort of couch it in the terms of a game and they sort of think about it that way. Or Foursquare, right? You, know, you, you build enough points and now you're the mayor of your favorite restaurant. Uh, and now your friends are competing with you to see who could be the mayor of your local bar. Uh, so they're adding this notion, this spreading notion of games um, into application software uh, or into everyday sort of web activities. 
you know, the question there, though, is does funware really mean score everywhere? That's sort of the low-level approach that we're seeing in this term. And Jesse Shell's speech at the DICE conference, which has made, you know, gone um, viral through the web, and I was there, uh, a lot of it sort of talks about this notion at, at, a, at a sort of low level of score being everywhere, and the, the psychology of score and what that might do. Um, but is that really games everywhere? And I would say it's part of it, but I think there's a lot more that we um, can do there, and we'll see, we'll see where that heads. Uh, another way that you can look at um, understanding the sort of power of games is um, some of this is uh, research at Stanford that Hope Lab did. On one side, you have passive exposure to the game remission. So this is basically watching the cutscenes in remission. Uh, and then on the other side, you see a brain scan of somebody actually playing remission. And in, uh, you don't have to be a neuroscientist to see how much more of the brain is being involved in the different areas, especially some of the emotional areas of the brain, uh, and where that might lead us to believe whether or not games are doing something special um, as we're playing them, to the, and, and special with the relationship between the information and, and our ability to retain it or do something or think about it. Uh, I think there's certainly going to be a lot more work here at our Games for Health conference. We had three sessions on uh, fMRI imaging and games and what they were trying to find out and learn about it. Uh, but this gives you a sense that there's something fundamental going on when people play video games. When you look at the culture of games, these are um, blurry uh, screenshots off of YouTube of commercials in China for Coca-Cola. Right? Kinky Friedman had, the, uh, had a book titled uh, Elvis, Jesus, and Coca-Cola, which he claimed were the three most often used words in the English language. So it gives you a sense of what Coca-Cola is. And from a marketing standpoint, you know, Coca-Cola tying, you know, Coca-Cola picking your brand to associate itself with is sort of a testament. And this is in China, which is just probably their most competitive market right now. Uh, and World of Warcraft is a phenomenon in China. And these are two commercials that they ran to basically associate the Coke brand with World of Warcraft. Uh, that's pretty powerful. Um, we've all heard of Avergaming, the idea of using a game like, you know, M&Ms in Pac-Man or Skittles, but where you play Pac-Man and you're supposed to have this sort of casual association. The, where we're going now, though, is we're seeing the ascendancy of games as a cultural force. And now you're seeing marketers want to cozy up to it the way it co they cozy up to the hit song of the day. Uh, and this is sort of a sea change that we've seen in the last five years. So we have this like sort of possibility gap that comes out of all of this. Um, this is a slide that I use to talk about this, which is you have sort of Moore's law, Metcalf's law on one axis, and then you have over time on the other. And what I would tell you about games when I talk to a lot of people who do learning is that when you look at the computing power, you need to do most of the e-learning technologies that we use today to deliver what we ostensibly call e-learning. It sort of peters out about circa 2002 for a computing platform. That's why netbooks are probably getting so popular, because most of what students are doing on them are accessing websites and message boards and maybe some light Java and Flash applets, uh, and mostly using like, things like Blackboard and Moodle. Uh, the, but the video game world tends to try and ride that cutting edge. Um, even Farmville, which is low end on graphics, is extremely high end on terms of how it scales its application framework and how it uses Facebook. Uh, to generate collaborative play. Uh, so it may be low on the, on the Moore's Law, but it's high on Metcalf's Law. And so we have this possibility gap, and people like myself are trying to mine that possibility gap and see what comes out of it. And this is why I think you also see organizational CEOs sort of looking at their, their learning platforms, their software platforms, and then going home to their kids playing Xbox and PS3 and going, something's not right here. They don't quite know what it is, but they see a lot more engagement and power and just action on this end. Computation, even. It doesn't, they don't have to be computer scientists to see something's going on there. And then they go back in and they watch a bunch of people staring at spreadsheets. And they're kind of wondering, wait a minute, you know, where's my IT investment? So we have this notion of games everywhere. And you know, I just pause for a second to say, you know, I'm not going to claim 100% it's beneficial. Obviously, I believe in a lot of it. But you know, I try to catch myself as much as possible. But I, I also want to think about how do we grow this, and really, what are the best practices? So I, I, I'm not going to claim to have all the answers here, but uh, I'm definitely following them from a question standpoint. But I said that I thought games should be a strategic resource to large organizations. So here's just looking at games from a strategic res resource from a personal level. So I like to be entertained. I like to, I like to take care of my health, or I like to think I do. 
Um, sometimes I need training. I need to learn a new computer language, or I need to, like, right now I'm obsessed about gardening, so I'm trying to understand and learn how to garden, uh, which gardening in Maine is a lot harder than gardening uh, here. Um, I've already lost two crops to frost. Um, who thought frost happened in May in Maine? I mean, what could I think? Uh, education, um, collaboration, uh, production. I like to make things, uh, and I do like to work because I sometimes like to get paid. Uh, but organizationally, we can also see similar things. You want to keep your employees healthy. You want to advertise your products and services and, and be known for them and get business as a result of it. You need to keep people trained up. You need to keep them educated. Uh, and you want to do things like science and research and R&D. Uh, and production in games as work. And like I said before with the serious games taxonomy, we've seen examples in all of these different areas, either on a personal level or scaled to an organizational level. And so much like we look at other media like books and m movies and music and video as being potentially strategic resources, whether they be on a communication level or on something deeper, why shouldn't games be part of that? Sure, they might lose out on certain problem-solving areas. They should. You know, maybe maybe a, a book is a better way, or a website is a better way to communi communicate or, or achieve a certain uh, application output. Uh, but there will be times, and I think over time we'll we'll hone what these are when games or properties from games applied to what we're doing will will be potentially the best fit. So these are some of the agencies um, in our government uh, that have looked at games. Uh, they've either done projects or held meetings to specifically understand them better. So again, these are other groups, large organizations trying to understand strategically um, where this could be useful. These are countries that have actually set up um, video game, serious game funds uh, with the dollar amounts, um, and there may be more. Um, these are direct strategic investment. Now some of this, um, just to be fair, is that they're worried that their commercial games industry, their commercial entertainment industry may not be advanced enough or have a market opening given how mature that business can be at times. And so they're trying to figure out how do they diversify uh, their development force into markets that may be more blue sky. Uh, but they're also looking specifically at also getting some of the residual gains for rethinking their education and training systems uh, in their own neck of the woods. Uh, so they, they've decided that these are somewhat strategic as well. And these are some of the large corporations that have done things with games or had similar meetings trying to figure out where these mean. And, and I don't mean to imply they're endorsing any of this. I'm just saying they're, they're kicking these tires as much as anybody trying to figure out what this means or to do things. Of course, if you just took Aver Gaming, you could probably go through about two-thirds of the Fortune 500 have done some sort of Aver Game at some point. And foundations and NGOs. Um, are also doing uh, a quite a bit of work. So let's move forward um, to design pattern evolution. So what's fueling, in my opinion, some of this activity? Uh, sure, in some ways it's capital availability and people with specific problems that have proven to be hard uh, and thus require that all hands on deck strategy. Uh, but games are this new part of the equation. However, I think it's also due to the evolution of many different types of games, especially computer and video games. So. Uh, this is sort of just a, a simple chart. You know, over here on the left, we have sort of physical games, card games, classroom games, board games. These are the games we grew up with before computers. And, then, and you have board games going all the way back to like ancient Egypt, uh, Senate, uh, sort of uh, kind of Mancala type game. Uh, looks sort of chess-like as well, um, being sort of the oldest cited board game. Then you got sort of role-playing games. This would have been in the 1970s, all of us hun hunkering around tables trying to roll dice and play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and you had some war games, the sort of grognards, um, fumbling around with these like sort of hexagonal chips and, try and rolling dice and, and using lookup tables. But then we got computers, and they could do things that we couldn't do. You could play the computer, so now you didn't have to have friends to come over. <laughs> well, you didn't have to have friends either, right? Like the old joke, I think, uh, there's a joke by Dimitri, uh, the comedian, Dimitri Martin, who said, uh, um, board games are, are a way of finding out which one of my friends I hate the most. Um, I think we've all been there. But uh, with the computer games, now all of a sudden you get an explosion of gaming because you don't need the logistical requirements of games. Plus, the computer doesn't let you cheat. Uh, or at least it's not supposed to, and sometimes that's invigorating from a game standpoint, not being able to cheat. So now you get into that, I really want to beat it. I can't just cheat my way through it. 
Uh, and you get this wonderful evolution where the first kinds of computer games you see are more sort of stolen from these earlier games. And then they start to evolve to the point where you're playing things where you're like, I'm not sure I could have been playing this before a computer. Great example, Tetris. It's not, a, it's not a game that really would have worked until a computer came along. Now, in the serious game space, what you have is sort of the re-envisioning of how games can be applied to other problems like education. Uh, and now we're stealing more from these internal computer game design patterns than we were from those original classroom games that gave us things like the first wave of things like, uh, you know, um, Oregon Trail or Reader Rabbit. Uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting. I would argue that these complex card games, you know, things like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, these came about because the, the computer games have become so sort not just popular, but had expanded our ability to game, to m juggle multiple factors, and to think in, a, in an even larger form about game design. And now all of a sudden, people started reapplying some of those ideas back to sort of offline games. And of course, now with these complex card games, you have this sort of hybrids, right? You play them both offline and online, um, trying to gain the benefits of both. When you look at design patterns in video games, the, the important thing to understand is just how varied they are. Uh, and from an e-learning standpoint, these are, it's kind of hard when you see the e-learning sort of paradigm. It's, we will take your content and pour it into our templates. But you can't do that with a video game because a time management game is not the same way you solve some other problem. So each of these becomes its own little miniature template that you have to kind of fit perfectly the round, the round peg into the round hole. Uh, and so these are just you know, nine common ones. Um, but what, what gets interesting is we started to study design patterns and really understand how much this really meant to the evolution of games and the serious game space and the idea of moving games everywhere. We started looking at a lot of these alternative design and engineering patterns. Uh, because in the serious game space, we don't have to worry about the fact that interactive fiction has no competitive value in commercial gaming, it's save for a few fans of the genre. But Let's say you're trying to teach like lawyers, right, who read lots of case studies, you know. Maybe that's the way to work with lawyers because it's in a modality that they're most, that in law school that they're, in, that they're most used to. We don't need a big fancy 3D courtroom. Um, we need something that might be more akin to the textbooks that they're using. But maybe interactive fiction is a way to put interactivity into that and bring some of those properties that we might believe in to it. So now we, we spend a lot of time going and looking at a lot of these alternative areas. So that, that brings me to places like Google Maps and looking and saying, who's, who's using Google Maps to make games? Because my next client might be a, a UPS who says, I need a logistical game and I need it to run in my browser. Uh, well, maybe Google Maps is the best way to do a logistical game. It's got all the data right there. All I have to do is graft a game on top of it. If you're UPS, uh, no problem, you'll find my email. Um, so you get things like fantasy sports and audio only. So a lot of these become new ways to solve problems. And what's interesting on the web is you can find small communities for all of these, either the antiquated ones or the emerging ones. And they're all moving that tech within that genre forward. <coughs> Another way to look at these design patterns and to summarize them though is, and this led us to a, a sort of breakthrough in thinking about how you move games everywhere is this notion of, how long um, you play a game and how long its lifespan is, its game arc. Uh, and what's interesting here is you have sort of short play, short lifespan games. So Bejeweled, you know, match three games, these sort of ephemeral viral games that go around like the uh, Paris Hilton stamping license plate game or um, four years ago the Zidane headbutt game from the World Cup. There's sort of get an email, ha ha ha, you click it and you, you play the game for 30 seconds. Or a game like Boom Blocks um, by EA and Steven Spielberg, which is uh, sort of like uh, Jenga on steroids. Um, you play these games maybe 15, 30 minutes at a time. You might play for a couple of hours over its lifespan or even just, just five minutes. And then they're done. You're not going to pick them back up. Then you have these like, sort of long play, short lifespan games like Grand Theft Auto or, or Red Dead Redemption, which is a current favorite. It has about maybe 80 hours of total gameplay. Um, but you play it in long blocks. This is where you hear about Madden Weekend or, or Grand Theft Auto, like people calling in sick. It's because they're going to spend about three days staying up till their eyeballs bleed at night to finish the game. And then that experience, as wonderful as it may be for them, is over. Uh, but they've, they've basically called in sick. They've gone offline. 
Uh, and then you have um, you know, the danger to all marriages and, and other long-term relationships of value, um, the long play, long lifespan game. So this is, uh, you know, don't bother me, we're going on a raid, uh, I won't be around this weekend. Um, I can't watch the kids, um, I'm gonna be busy. Um, or Civilization IV, you know, a game that I just keep coming back to. When I go into a Civ game, and you know, it's like six or seven hours uh, of effort, um, maybe over a couple of days. Uh, and I just keep coming back to that. I think it was, um, it was a Cory Doctorow or somebody similar who said, uh, I, I was born to like write and play Civilization. But are any of those really conducive to the way we work in our, in our lives other than on our entertainment and leisure time? Um, they're not really. The short play, short lifespan game might work a little bit for a part task simulator, uh, but it's probably not going to incur a lot, of basic, a lot of deep information. The long play, short lifespan game, you know, 80 hours of gameplay, that could probably do it, but how many, how can you, can you go into a, a K through 12 classroom and just say, we're going to disrupt, you know, the syllabus and no child left behind scheduling for six days while everybody plays this game? Uh, you can't go into um, a modern day corporation and say, oh yeah, um, we're just going to take the sales staff offline for a week. It just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, you can't, certainly can't do long play, long lifespan game. It's just like, might as well just fire them. Uh, and then, so then you come back to this short play, long lifespan game, and I said to myself, I said, well, where were these games? And a lot of them were sort of these fantasy sports games. And, and this was pre-Farmville, so you could kind of put Farmville in there too, a lot of the social network games. Uh, and it's really interesting. You play this game for about 15 or 20 minutes to set up your squad to, in the morning. Then you go to work, you think about it all day, but you're basically productive. You're thinking about it in the back of your mind. Then you make some more changes before the game starts so that you could set your roster. And then the game commences. And then there's, you know, if it's basketball, it's an 82 game season. If it's baseball, it's a 160 game season. Uh, and so, you have this really interesting version of a lot of gameplay in little amounts of time over a long arc, which is for organizations doing planning or thinking in, in these longer terms. How do we launch a new product? How do, we do a, how do we rejigger our sales strategy? How do we think through a big problem? This might be the way that we can get in and be useful for them. Uh, so this is a way of looking at almost every kind of game made and sort of organizing your thoughts about where, how it works to the way people work and live. So now we get a little bit more into serious games. So often this is what I'm told. Um, I sit in the audience like this and someone else comes up and I, I start cringing given what I've shown you so far. Uh, and I just want to make sure that we got that, that this is wrong. Uh, when I look at some of the games that are done, there's a, a Sony um, camera game for exercise. There's a, a heart visualization inside the Unreal 3 engine. Down in here, this is Fold It, which is basically people folding proteins as a productivity game. They're not necessarily, yes, they might be learning some things, but that's not the point of this. This isn't to raise a new biochemist. It's to say, I don't care what you do in your re regular w walk of life, if you can play this game and fold this protein better than someone else, that's what I care about. I care about the answer. Um, exercise doesn't really necessarily involve learning unless you want to be a learning scientist and argue that's everything. Um, it's really about getting a heart rate sustained for a certain amount of time so that you burn calories and, and improve cardiovascular health. Here you've got a safety game, you've got sales training, um, medical training for um, surges at hospitals for mass casualty events, stuff done on portable platforms. Uh, the person holding the computer actually used a, a video game by um, Peter Molyneux called The Movies to basically animate a movie about the French riots and put it up on the web because he was disturbed that the media that was reporting coverage from the French riots was getting the story wrong and he wanted to get out his story. Uh, he had something about a million downloads, I think, on YouTube and, and otherwise. So he had used this game to build his film. So this is a game as a production environment. Um, we've done some work at my firm um, as part of our Games for Health project um, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look at um, the idea of what happens when video games and health records come together. So not only reskinning a health record to look more like the avatar creation screen in something like The Sims or Second Life um, or indie games like Kudos, um, but also thinking about how the devices that are building these health games uh, and making things like Dance Dance Revolution and Wii Fit available, how should they talk to our health record so that they can actually do something more than just be this game or be this self-contained executable that's tracking our health. Um, this is where the sort of world of web services starts to creep in even more 
and where it's also clear that it's not creeping in yet, except in our brains and on our cute little storyboards. We can divide up the serious game space even more. We can look at how gamers um, use games to do something interesting besides play them, how third party people like teachers will take a game and build a syllabus around it. They don't recode the game. They just take something like civilization and adjust it as a, as a lesson plan uh, in their history class, dealing with the things that civilization probably gets wrong, but also accentuating the thematic um, rule sets in civilization that really do dovetail nicely with what they're trying to get students to understand. Developers will do things. They'll add non-entertainment modes of play to their games, uh, like what you see in some um, rock band, like the drum trainer and other types of things. Uh, and then we'll also see just the baseline technologies taken. Uh, these uh, commercial off-the-shelf related serious game space, we spent a lot of time looking at user-led innovation and how the things that we just are shipped as commercial games are actually serious game projects. Um, they either could be mods of, of famous games or they could be actual games that have come out on the market like Your Self Fitness or Brain Age or My Life Coach uh, or some of these things like the movies that allow people to create their own animations. And we've all seen some of the Wiimote hacks all around YouTube and what people have done with those, controlling robots and everything else. Uh, so again, really looking um, long uh, at, a, at a wide gamut of activity. We've even seen hardware repurposing. I forgot to include the photo of the uh, uh, military robot that is controlled by an Xbox controller. Uh, so taking that, that controller and, and reusing it. So we've seen a lot of opportunity there. Um, on the Avergaming side, like I said before, there's a lot of simplistic understanding of what Avergaming is. This is a, a chart that we use to build out the space a little bit more. So we look both at using games, but also this whole area where you get game association. Basically, brands sort of using games. So like uh, in, a couple of years ago on TV, all I would see is this Volvo commercial where the entire Volvo car was inside um, DICE's rally sport for the Xbox. Um, I don't think they were using that to go after the typical Volvo consumer. They were, they were using that to say, hey, we're hip, we're cool, we're, we're not just this state old car. And if you want to finish the race, maybe you need a Volvo. At least finish in one piece. So we looked at um, games in production. These are off-the-shelf games that either include modes where you can do things like the Project Gotham Racing. I guess one of the programmers was a real video, uh, photography buff. And so he added all kinds of things like motion blurs and f-stop and all kinds. And basically, you could practice all the different types of camera settings that you would in like a photography class inside this video game, taking pictures of high-speed car races. Uh, and there's artists who use the Unreal Engine to create art. So we're seeing all these kinds of media mashups. We're seeing um, various types of usage segments around work. Um, so we're seeing things like direct earnings in games, using games to either um, express or, or assess opinions like prediction markets and opinion research. Uh, and we're seeing people who work to play, meaning they put effort into their play. They're a guild leader. They're writing walkthroughs. They're basically training other players. Um, or they play to work, so that'd be like your sort of gold farmer or your professional gamer. So this goes well beyond the sort of you know, two hour fun on a Saturday afternoon. And we can look at work in other forms. So exercise is a form of work. And um, we can be sort of casually involved in it, or we could get really personally invested in it, or we could get really actively engaged. Uh, and we can move up these sort of different levels of activity. So you can go from just joining a guild to leading a guild. Uh, and if you've ever looked at uh, Constant Steinkuhler's work, mapping the sort of management skills used to lead a guild and, and then watching it map directly on top of a middle level manager in an information um, oriented company, it's like one to one, uh, except one of them is a 14 year old kid. So we can look at this progression of um, work in games. I'm sort of going quite quickly to make up for time, but. There are different levels that we see. We see people moving from a sort of novice level of work to a sort of mastery level of work in games. Uh, then we have this sort of um, number of uh, commercial off the shelf activity. We're seeing things like sports pre-visualization packages. We're seeing this sort of brain um, game, sort of cognitive health stuff. We've seen stuff taken from games for architecture markets uh, as well as um, uh, teaching and education. And you can look at this as sort of a, a, a sort of moving force. You know, on one end, we have sort of instructors and utilizers. People are more interested in, uh, in, in direct education. Now, on the other end, we have these game developers really sort of working on entertainment, but also education. 
uh, in terms of like if your gamers aren't educated on how to play your game, if they're if they're they don't level up through that mastery, they're going to reject your game. And then we could sort of see these non-entertainment users and these entertainment and gamers, and we could see that serious game sort of morphs beyond just its most core attitude towards these other types of uses uh, of games, depending on which way it's moving, it's being pulled from, what direction it's being pulled from the most. As a result of this, you know, you've probably seen, I hope, a big picture argument uh, that games are evolving in this sort of Cambrian explosion in many different parts of our life. Uh, games are also changing the commercial games level two, where new markets are evolving due to platform changes and other trends. So what are some of those shifts? So we're seeing organizational video games requiring different approaches uh, and sort of creating a different need for games. So that would be you know, where I spend most of my life really trying to reformulate what games are going to look like in web browsers. Because it's really hard to think that we're going to have um, a lot of video games working at the edge of the network inside these large organizations. They can't secure it. They don't want to manage it. Uh, they can't even put GPUs at the edge of that network enough, um, depending on what we're trying to do. Uh, so you're seeing these supporting elements also, supporting elements like Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, the things that wrap around a game, not just the game itself. And these are becoming even more important um, at times than the games. Uh, we're seeing how mobile devices and their proliferation are requiring a whole new take on how cross-platform development is going to work. Uh, and we're seeing this interface novelty, the things like the Wii, things like Wii Fit, things like Sony's new Move platform or Project Natal, uh, changing the way we use games and creating new opportunities, as well as free, free game models, advertising supported models, uh, digital download pricing, uh, spurring this growth in what I call good enough games. By changing some other element of the value proposition of a game, creating a Wii controller, or creating a free game with, a, with a in-game transaction models, um, you're seeing gamers around the world sort of get into games that normally might have been rejected under the old critical sort of aspect. Oh, is this the latest, greatest thing? They're being brought in in different ways, and they're finding different ways to sort of decide that a game is really cutting edge. Wii Tennis is Pong on, a, on, a, on an old sort of level graphics platform, but it is phenomenally fun because of the way that controller works. And so we're getting this sense of good enough games. I'm starting to see a lot more gamers not too worried about having the latest and greatest. Just is it good and why is it good? And that axis of why it's good has just become so much more proliferated. But this uh, games as service is kind of interesting. Um, because as you get more into the idea that games become services, uh, you start to see the struggles sort of playing out in front of your eyes in the games industry. Which is the more that a game is a, a, an always present, always available, cross-platform, plugged into your social network and all kinds of other sort of elements of your digital life, the more it's like a service. Uh, and the more it's like a service, the more it sort of has to live in the cloud. And so where we see is where most games are, but where I think we're heading. And this battle over processing uh, is kind of interesting. There's Call of Duty Modern Warfare. This is a game you need an Xbox uh, control, you know, or a PlayStation to play because the graphics are so rich. But when you look at where games are going, the, the, those games will always be present, but they're being sort of drowned out by a lot of these other games, running in browsers, uh, running on uh, lighter weight mobile platforms. Uh, and that is really, really interesting, because it's that, those types of games that are going to get games everywhere. Because we need different types of games. This is a chart that just shows the organizational interests and the games industry interests. And you can basically, if you look at that, just starting with the languages used, you could see these people are at odds. And the game industry, or all of us gamers, are going to have to kind of adjust if we want to see games really become useful for these large organizational interests. And these could be formal organizations or informal organizations, groups of us around the world trying to solve a problem or need. So they have this sort of different um, games, because an individual is, tends to want to be close to the hardware, has lots of time, and an organization wants to be close to the web, they have security, and they don't have lots of time. And then both of them are dealing with this on-the-go pervasive access question. So we get this sort of usage gap that goes on um, in the serious game space, which is that um, when we look at the commercial off-the-shelf um, game market for things like exercise, the game existing is, is interesting, but, and you look at the sales, 
But when you go and look at the usage, it's not quite there. In other words, there's more Wii Fits in the world than there are people playing Wii Fit or, or staying on Wii Fit, like an adherence principle. So what I have to spend time in is thinking about how do I close that gap? Because the Wii Fit or other next generation extra games are going to be incredible tools for health. But they're not going to be incredible tools if we can't hook them up to health records, if we can't hook them up to reminder systems, if, they can't, if we can't hook them up to all these things that I've learned in studying behavior change and that people in the behavior change industry are using. So until we can connect those two pieces together, we're, 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 we're going to have more of that gap. So you think about what types of behavior changes we want to we want to work on, improving study habits, health, productivity habits, raising people's self-esteem. And where you get that is where do those traits come from? They come from the surrounding elements, sometimes even more so than the game itself. Even if the game is tremendously great at involving you in something and getting you to think differently or act differently as a result of play or even during play. But when I think about it, here's our game. But here are the surrounding elements, or some of them, that I can envision putting around a game that I'm looking to actually have be far more effective than just from an entertainment standpoint. And what I'm saying is, is that if we probably have to look at simplifying some of our games, I think this is actually what's happening anyways, and then adding complexity and services and robustness in these outer edges and connecting these two things together. And that will make our games even more effective and create the need or, or the ability for them to be real deep solutions um, in other areas. The funny thing is, is when you do this, you're basically applying all that leverage to the outer side of things. These things tend to be reusable irregardless of the game. And so you get a, a sense of providing more value for the dollar so you can potentially drive down the costs and the risks of your game as a result of that and increase points of sale and reduce piracy even. So with these new models, have new needs. And so what creates games everywhere? So there's sort of two paths. One is the browser. And not just the browser from four years ago, but browsers that allow us to run rich web applications that render out in HTML form, like Neptune's Pride, a really kind of interesting strategy game built on top of GWT. Um, Lords of Ultima, it, this is EA doing sort of the same thing. This is an HTML rendered game. Um, Soren Johnson, who was involved in Civilization and Spore, has, has built a GWT level project um, for strategy games, and he's, level, he's building this out. And I've seen the work that's been done here, where you basically ported Quake 2 with HTML5 over to on top of GWT and created basically the uh, Quake 2 running inside a browser. So Quake 2 is kind of like the hello world, the 3D engine, game engine. So if you can get it to run on anything, this, people spend their time doing this. There's also this remotely re rendered uh, secure gameplay model. This is where we render the, the game inside a, a, a server uh, area and then basically pump out encrypted MPEG and then back basically a remote, basically a joystick at the long end of a long, long, long wire. Now, there's, there's two companies kind of working on this. There may be some others. Uh, you know, there's some issues with latency, but a lot of, a lot of games as we've seen, very successful games don't need, don't have latency problems. Who, who cares if your Farmville has a little bit of latency? You still got to wait a day for your crops, anyways. And we're seeing games um, meeting people. The other fork is to meet people where they are. So not just move to a new platform, but to think about where they're working. So there's a game in Gmail. I mean, albeit a, a, a demo. There's uh, Seriosity, which is basically embedding a social um, economy on top of email. So embedding itself into Microsoft Outlook and Mail.app and other types of mail programs uh, to create a new type of social network game um, in organizations. Uh, the NetherNet, which was a startup that went bust but has open sourced all its code as a toolbar, is a browser-based game um, using a toolbar. And then there's Ribbon Hero from Microsoft. But we need this game app engine. Something that looks like this, that includes things like YouTube and Google Maps, that takes these APIs and, turn, and allows us to turn out rich games within this context so that we can push them everywhere for all kinds of problems. I thought this was really cool because they used YouTube basically for the cutscene inside this browser based game. Uh, and then, you know, DDR hooked up to Google Health. And so I start thinking about all these different pieces of the web services that surround the game. I start thinking about how web browsers and different types of consoles even have web browsers. And you, know, you start to see WebKit showing up more and more. I start thinking about these types of ideas where I'm just playing 
with what would that whole stack of technologies look like and how would they interact uh, and how would they create games that could even um, involve moves where I could do anything because humans are in the loop to judge the game, not just the computer. So I look at Google Wave and I say, wow, I could build really rich role playing and decision making games uh, in a corporate environment in that, long, that short play long lifespan mode. Uh, and how could we apply that? So I think about things like Foldit and citizen science. You know, a citizen science game on top of Google Wave using Google Maps uh, and all these technologies, that could be really, really interesting. And could be the kind of tool set that we could use over and over again. So what's needed? Um, in order to get there, we need to drive down the cost of the surrounding infrastructure in the first playable. A lot of organizations have trouble um, green lighting games. It, it's hard to say I'm going to do this to my bo for my boss. And so we need to drive down that ability for them to get something up on the screen where, th where everybody in the organization goes, yes, that is what we want and it's going to work. Uh, we need specialized engines, not just general purpose. Uh, and we want to think about how these games can move everywhere in our infrastructure, both our personal life and our work uh, and our entertainment and the other kinds of causes that we take in life. So that's my sense of games everywhere. Thank you. So I believe I'm around for a little bit to talk. I know it's maybe not questions. I can take some questions. And then um, I know I'm going to be meeting with Matt's team who's working on some game ideas within their group that sound really interesting as well. Uh, and so I'd be happy to provide perspective or anything while I'm here today. So E3 tomorrow. So. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about badging reward systems. Um, seems to be all the craze. Um, is there longevity in that? And, in, uh, in which things? Uh, in badges, such as Foursquare, Oh, badges Gawala. and Foursquare, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you should certainly look at Jesse Shell's speech at DICE. Um, I mean, he sort of really put that forward in a big way uh, and talked about some things that a lot of us have been thinking about. Uh, I think that there's a need for sort of a, a system that could allow us to bring those, those ideas to almost any application or frame of work. Um, not just one that's embedded inside a particular application. Uh, I worry about whether or not we end up in a situation where everything's badged and everything has a score and what does that mean? It probably means some of us have to be more creative. Um, it, it's hard to say what's going to happen when badges and score are everywhere. A lot of gamers don't necessarily respond to score. I'm a lifelong hardcore gamer. Sometimes I respond to score. Sometimes I respond to narrative or just moving through levels. Um, but it's clear, looking at Xbox Live, that it's kind of like a learning management system. It has a lot of, a lot of similarities. Uh, in fact, it has a lot of things that it exceeds learning management systems at. So there's a lot we can learn from. I think we're in the early stage. You didn't mention Second Life. Sure. So I, 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 the question was, I, I didn't necessarily mention Second Life and virtual worlds, those sort of close cousins to games. Uh, what I found, at least in the moment, the current um, virtual worlds have lots of opportunity. Um, I'm finding that many of the ones, Second Life aside, are fairly weak environments compared to what my game development friends and I could build. So I'm sort of puzzled as to why that's come about. I think part of it's because the people who built those were sort of thinking more from a, a, a go-to meeting standpoint as opposed to rich environments for, for activity. The other part of it, though, is that um, I think some of that area has, has fallen victim to social networking um, applications and games, where the virtual world really is a little bit more virtual, but is much more highly social and asynchronous. The video game industry has really been obsessed by synchronous communication and activity. Uh, and it's only when we start to explore asynchronous stuff, which is really the way we work a lot more, that we're starting to, I think, see a, a lot more opportunity. Uh, in that vein, and that's, that's been kind of interesting to watch the games industry deal with that. Um, Spore is called a massively single player game, and it really is a big asynchronous game, and I think that, that may actually hold more value to us going forward. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see that, actually. You didn't say much about virtual currency and uh, strategies for monetizing uh, games. Yeah. I, the, one of the things that I think we need a, a little bit, and that's helping this, is are all these different business models around not only virtual currencies, but like small transaction games. Anything that sort of 
provides the ability for the value for the gamer to be just get involved, the attention economy, so to speak, and that's um, been quite helpful. The problem is, is that we don't really have a lot of robust systems for indiv individual developers to kind of play at that, to build that infrastructure as easily. Um, I think as we do, we'll start seeing, you know, again, more of this Cambrian explosion, because it's the smaller indie groups, the universities, the organizations that have problems that are turning to this, and they, they're the ones that are sort of lacking the infrastructure. So uh, perhaps as we see those platforms come into play, we'll see more of this. Thanks. So uh, everyone's welcome to come over to Charlie's. A few of us are going over there to have lunch, and you can bring some of your questions over there. We're going to finish up now.